Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Blessings to you on this Easter morning as we gather together uh, to celebrate once again the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This morning's text is from our gospel reading, here again from a section of Mark chapter 16. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And they said to them, and he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who, ha- who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb. For trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for, their, for they were afraid. We see here the announcement of the resurrection uh, of Jesus by an angel here in the tomb. Yet specifically in the Gospel of Mark, it's not what seems like maybe an overly comforting announcement as we see in the reaction of the women. The reality of what took place on that first Easter, if you were living in that moment, in the very moment that it was taking place, is not an overly comforting scene. The women in the story are truly afraid. And when they see the tomb was empty and Jesus, who had been there, say, and it was said of him that he has been risen just as he had said. He had prophesied over and over that he was going to rise from the dead. Reality was falling upon these women and fear began to set in And that is sometimes how the real Easter hits. You see, Easter is not oftentimes thought of as a scary or a frightening holiday, right? We we think of Easter as, well, flowers, uh, maybe some bunnies when you get home, a chocolate bunny or two, or, or eggs, or whatever it might be. That's what Easter kind of is, is associated oftentimes in our head. It's, it's candy, it's green grass, it's joyous things. It's life, right? Jesus rose from the dead. It's life. But I want you for a moment to think about what actually took place on that first Easter morning. The experiences of these women must have been truly terrifying. I don't know about you, but I've never seen anybody rise from the dead. And guess what? Most likely they hadn't really either. Well, Jesus maybe healed some people, brought some people back to life, but it it wasn't quite as stark. It wasn't quite as big of a shocker as Jesus now rose from the dead. It's very easy to read the gospel, read the resurrection story. It's very easy to hear these things and see these women as simply characters in a story. Characters who don't really have emotions, who don't really have too many thoughts. They're just part of the story, right? But these are real people, just like you and me. These are real people who had just witnessed some of the most historic events on the face of the planet. They had watched their teacher be beaten, mocked, and killed. They had watched the one who proclaimed that he was the Son of God die on a cross. Bunnies and flowers were not what they were experiencing. Rather, they found an angel sitting in the tomb who said to them, He's not here. He is risen. He is risen from the dead. And it hit them. It hit them, the reality that they had been hearing Jesus preach about over and over. This reality that he was the Son of God was now coming not only to their ears, but also to their eyes. 
They were beginning to bump up against the reality of who God was in Jesus Christ. And if we truly ponder what took place on the first Easter morning and we hear the Word of God in what it tells us, it is not unreasonable to think that a bit of fear is an appropriate reaction when we are confronted with the reality that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. If one comes to church because it's, well, it's the tradition, it's what we do on Easter morning, and last year we couldn't do it, so we need to make sure that we get there today, well, Easter then is not an overly scary thing or a fearful thing. But if we hear these words and we understand what the scriptures are actually saying to us, this is not simply a tradition. This is a stark reality in our lives. And if we ponder it, it should give us pause. If we think about what has truly taken place, it may actually give us a moment of, well, just like these women, fear. Because we are bumping up to the reality of who God is and what he has done for us. Just as those women were real people who had real problems, we are no different. And the news that Jesus was risen from the dead doesn't just make problems disappear. And in fact, initially, it can actually exasperate some of the challenges in front of us. Just like these women, they had been going through some difficult times. They had been struggling. And okay, so Jesus was not in the tomb, but now what? Now what is life going to be like? What are some of the things that are going to arise out of this reality that Jesus Christ is not dead? What were their lives going to look like? It would be quite the adventure, as we would read in much of the rest of the New Testament, as we would witness through history the challenges that have met believers of the one who is risen from the dead are stark indeed. The resurrection can very naturally bring about fear because it is revealing who Jesus truly is. He is the Son of God, a.k.a. God in human form. One of the lines that I say to my confirmads on a fairly regular basis is that when someone rises from the dead, we should probably listen to what they have to say. We should probably pay attention to the things that they have to say. And so Jesus is the one who rose from the dead, and he had a lot of things to say as well. And some of those things can actually cause us to find angst within our hearts, to find that we maybe shouldn't be around this one who rose from the dead. Jesus had a lot to say, and many of his words are not always easy to hear. He talks a lot about how we are to live in relationship to God, in relationship to one another. He says that hatred in your heart is equivalent to murder. He tells us to love our enemies as ourselves. He calls for us to be perfect as God is perfect. He, can, he condemns divorce. He says that sin is so serious that it would be better if one cut off their hand or gouged out their eye rather than that leading them into sin. Now some might think that, well, he's just speaking hyperbolically. He's just speaking to a different culture who had a different way of doing things, so on and so forth. And you know what, if those women had gotten to the tomb on that Sunday after Good Friday and he was still in there, I would accept that, that his teaching was conditional to his time or that he was simply trying to make a point. But he wasn't in the tomb. He was God himself. His word is perfect. And when we hear it, we are confronted by that very word. And when we as sinners bump up against the reality of God, it can be an uncomfortable thing because it exposes who each and every one of us are. Adam and Eve responded in fear after they sinned. When God approached them, they hid. They wanted to get away from God. 
Isaiah is brought into the throne room of God and he falls down. He's cowering before God and he says, I am a man of unclean lips. He is fearful for he is in the presence of one who is holy. The three disciples fell to the ground at the transfiguration when Jesus took them up on the mount and was transfigured before them. They fell down. Why? Because they were in the presence of the glory of God. They understood that they were not worthy to be there. When people bump up to the reality of God and who he is and what he has done, the initial reaction is, can and is oftentimes and rightfully so fear because we are exposed we cannot make defense for anything in our lives so how do we deal with this reality of fear when it comes to encountering God when it comes to encountering a resurrected Lord and Savior whose words oftentimes expose us in a very real way. One must acknowledge that fear is a reasonable reaction. When they are before God, for that is simply to confess that God is holy and we ourselves are not. It is proper to ask and ponder, just like Mary did when she was confronted by an angel herself. So, Christmas and Easter, oftentimes, two, we think of them in two different ways, but they are intimately connected. When Mary was told that she was with child, an angel came to her. And this is what the text says in Luke chapter 1, verses 29 and 30. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. What kind of message is this from the angel in the tomb? This is the question we must answer. And it is, and it, like the message that was brought to Mary, is one just the same. We need not fear due to what Jesus has done. We have found favor with God. Our favor is based not in how well we have kept his word, not in how well we ourselves have lived, for that is clear. We have not lived well enough. And over this past year, there have been many reasons for fear to consume the hearts of humanity. There have been many reasons for us to be concerned, to be consumed by the world around us. There are threats of death from all sorts of different angles. There was the prospect of suffering for all sorts of different reasons. And though that might happen, and then those things could happen, we have felt as though we have not been in control. And that brings about fear in the hearts of humanity. The driver of this fear, the driver of this fear is that we all fear death in some way, shape, or form. Yet when we trust that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, it puts the events of life in a different light. This past year has been tough. It has not been overly enjoyable for many different reasons, but we need not fear. We need not fear that we have in fact had sin fall upon us. We need not fear because of sickness. We need not fear because of the health issues that we see. We need not fear because death is knocking at our door. Death does not get the last word. Rather, life and salvation for all those who believe in Jesus Christ is what has the final word. Romans 10, 8 and 10. What does this say? The word is near you, in your mouths and in your hearts. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. 
It is my prayer that you do not leave here today in fear. That the end of the story isn't like the last word of our gospel reading, they left and they were trembling and afraid. Rather that you would leave this place with faith. Faith in Jesus Christ. And in that faith, hear those words. Do not fear, for you have found favor with God because of Jesus who is risen from the dead. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.